So no, uh, you know, you love it. Please mute yourself. I will can mute you from it. Thank you so much. Okay, so you know, coming into Canada, the few things that I'd learned when I first had my baby were the things I came in with. And then along the line, you realize, oh, this shows up. The baby is teething. What should you do? The baby, you know, colicky. What should you do? And you're trying to get information from wherever. But now, thank God that um, technology has made life a little better. So technology has made it so that at least you can Google things up, which sometimes also happens to be a problem because then you Google, your child is coughing or sneezing, and you Google it up, and you're seeing pneumonia, you're seeing everything out there, RSV, and you're like, hey, what's going on? So let's, you know, be cautious. Yes, that's the word, be cautious when you you know, checking on Google for things. But the first thing you need to know as a first time parent is that you will be fine, okay? You will be fine. Look around you. There are so many other people raising children. We all started out as a first time parent. Yes, some people had multiple help when they started off. Some people didn't have any help at all when they started off. So just, you know, breathe, relax. You will be fine. So I need you to know that if you're a first time parent, you're doing your best, irrespective of what your mother says. And I put that there because, you know, I know sometimes you'll call your parents if you still have a mom or your mother-in-law or one auntie and they'll be like, eh, you did what? Why would you? This and that, you took him. Irrespective of what they say, you're doing the best you can with the knowledge that you have. And, you know, every day we're developing, we're learning new things. So just keep learning. Just keep having an open mind to know that you're on this journey for a lifetime. You're going to have those children until you, you know, leave uh, the world. Don't be too hard on yourself. And you know what I'm telling the first time parents also applies to us that, you know, our kids are preschoolers or maybe even older kids. Don't be too hard on yourself. We are all learning on this job. Parenting, nobody came from heaven knowing how to parent a child. We all go to our manual as Christians, as a Bible. We all ask questions, you know, the parenting coach, other people that have older kids around you, your community, your friends and all that. So we are all learning on the job. So don't be too hard on yourself. Or maybe your child, you know, is still bedwetting at three and everybody's like, ah, they should have stopped bedwetting. It's okay. Take one day at a time, work with the child, you know, use all the resources at your disposal until your child stops bedwetting. So there is no one size fits it all. There is no every child must walk by their first birthday. Some children did not. Some children decided I'm not walking. And when they were ready to walk, they got up. They didn't crawl for long and they started walking. And guess what? Some children started walking by eight months. It is different. You know, God created us. If you look at our fingers on our hands, like they say in my tribe, you know, or if you put them together, they are not all the same. Okay. They, are, they have different lengths. So don't be too, too hard on yourself. No one was born. No one was born knowing how to raise a child. We are all learning and we all started from the scratch. Then accept help. Okay, I'm going to have to find this person and mute them. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, you know, accept help. I know that one we struggle with because they're like, do I trust this person? Do I trust that person? What did they give my child? Do they have good intentions and all that? But just look around you, you know, and be, you know, look around. There will at least be one person or two persons that will be sincere and genuine and they really want to help you for you know, helping you seek, not so they can see, if not for me later in the future, not so they can, you know, talk about your family or whatever. Be watchful of scanners. Your mental health is very, very important. Accept help, but still be, you know, watchful and cautious of who you're accepting help from. And now this is the one that uh, concerns both first-time parents that have infants or those that are kids are, you know, still that preschool age or maybe even in grade one. If you have more than one child, you know mornings can be very chaotic. Mornings can be very dramatic. Mornings can be something that you know everybody is just rushing. One thing I always say to myself is the mood at which you get your children ready in the morning, they carry it with them to wherever they go, whether it's daycare, uh, preschool, kindergarten, or elementary school. They carry that mood with them. So you said you actually set the mood for your children's day. So let's be more proactive, especially when you're waking up them up in the morning. Not every child wants to wake up early. Some of us adults, some of us people will still say I'm not a morning person. 
because you know we like our sleep we like our comfort we don't like you know waking up too early especially if your work is such that maybe you have to resume work at 7 30 or 8 a.m and you have to get your children you know out to the daycare by 7 30 a.m they're always the first one to get to daycare and sometimes children pick on that you know i run a daycare also and i remember last week everybody all the morning people just came late so by the time the boy that normally comes around 8 8 15 got here he was shocked that there was nobody that for the first time he was the first one at daycare so our children pick up on things like that so just be proactive in the money you know wake them up in a nice way even if you're running late you know not the get up get up get up let's go try and you know have a little more empathy to the fact that you're waking them up early and the be proactive portion of it means you plan your day to, you plan your day ahead and that's the next point plan your day ahead and share the work i'm hoping there are men on the line today or you're going to share this with your husband and please take screenshots i'm not um i will try and share the powerpoints but i'm talking more than what's on the powerpoint so i can still share with the powerpoint later plan the day ahead share the work um back in the days when we were younger daddies just got dressed and drove and left for work and mommies had to do everything but things are changing right now you're realizing you need both hands at work and when i was that age we had aunties and uncles living with us so there were people mom could send on around you do this you do that they were helpers around but now especially in diaspora you're on your own with your young children so i always encourage fathers to get involved don't leave it for mommies only raise them together as you know as much as you can do you know brushing their teeth combing their hair helping them to dress up and stuff like that. Let's do it together. It will make the work easier in the morning. So the other portion of sharing the work is uh, as your children, uh, you know, there's this funny, uh, funny thing I saw on Instagram the other day about if your child knows how to operate a TV remote, they know how to operate your phone, then they can do chores. Okay. The kids nowadays, it's like they came from heaven with that finger ready to swipe your phone and they know what to press. They go on YouTube. Uh, my nephew the other day went on Facebook live. <laughs> so when I saw the Facebook, I, I looked at it. I said, ah, this boy, this mom didn't know that he was doing this. So I notified the mom that your son has been busy, you know, on Facebook. So if they can do that, that means they can pick out clothes. Even if the, all they can pick is their socks and their underwear. You know, and the shirt and the, and the pants to wear the next day. Get them involved in sharing that work. So that um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, in between that, get your laundry done. By Sunday latest, have their clothes picked out for five days of the week and stack them somewhere. So it's not in the money that you're sorting through, looking for socks, looking for everything. Everything. In fact, when my kids were younger, and even the youngest one and that's turning 10, she still does it. She knows by tomorrow she has to have her five clothes for the school week set out, including underwear and socks. So everything neatly packed one by one, and then we stack it on top of each other. So she has her five day supplies. And if she decides, I don't want this, this today, I want that, it's okay. The five clothes are there. It makes your life easier in the morning. If you have the kids that love to play with everything and you think they will mess up where the clothes are, then keep it in your room instead of their room. So then in the morning, you just grab you know what they need for each day put it on their bed get their food to dress up another thing about um morning time for us here in in canada in north america is the fact that children below the age of six don't necessarily have to shower every morning if you don't have the time if you have the time for it, it's fine good shower them every morning if your mornings are busy then move your shower night times to the night by the time they're getting up to age seven and eight when puberty sometimes starts showing up then they can start showering every morning and by then they should also be able to shower themselves to a greater extent so that reduces your work in the morning so do all of those things are some of the things we can do to lessen the work in the morning then count your cost so i put count your cost in there because i went back to school when my kids were age three and one and i went for a five-year program and my counting my cost means that when i'm picking my classes i can't afford to pick a class that starts at 7 30 or 8 a.m except when I had no other option. So the earliest my classes will start to be 8.30 a.m. So that gives me a little leeway in the morning to get them ready, get them in the car. Dad drove them to daycare. I took my own bus, went my way to school. I also counted my cost in knowing what time my classes will end during the day, go to the library before pick up time from daycare. So you count all of that, you factor all of that. What, what 
kind of job do you have? If you work evenings, then you know, okay, the other spouse must work day or something like that. So that there's an overlap of, you know, both of you being at home with them. And when both of you are not, at least one person is at home. And be prepared. Things can happen in the morning. Someone might have a running nose and you're debating, can they go to school? Can they not go to school? Have a village around you so that there's at least someone you can call. And if there's nobody, you know, does your work know? How do you go about calling for family leave and all that? The last point here is take advantage of driving time for breakfast. So one thing I realized is most of the mornings we're fighting our children over eat your breakfast, eat your breakfast. Okay. Okay. So I see someone was saying they couldn't get in, but they've gotten in now. Okay. So, you know, let them eat in the car. My car was a messy car when my kids were younger. And then there's another slide I will talk about doing chores together. So we now clean the car together later on the weekend. So their food. So I have a few things here. Uh, Ziploc bag is the first one. Ziploc bag is your one of your best friends when you have children that age. Containers are good also if you have the time to do dishes or maybe you have a dishwasher or something like that. But sometimes I find that just bread, you know, two slices of bread with jam in the mid, uh, uh, with jam on it and cut it up in small bites and put it in a Ziploc and have a sippy cup. So I couldn't find my sippy cup. I think I've taken everything to take here. A sippy cup, something with a straw that if it falls down in your car, it won't spill that much. Grab it. Have it already already because you know you're going to run late in the morning. Get them into their car seats. They're still in car seats till age eight, so everybody is in car seats. Get it into their car seat. Put the cups there. Give them their food. I run a daycare, so I have two kids that come really early in the morning, and most times they show up with their breakfast in a Ziploc bag and their sippy cup. I mean, immediately they come in, put it on the table, go wash your hands, sit down and eat your breakfast. So that's where you also need to network with whoever your child caregiver is to let them know you have busy mornings. I'll drop them off early. Can you please make sure they eat their breakfast? And my, the daycare my kids were in that time, they were very good with that also because my kids happened to be one of the first that came each day. Network with other parents. And um, like I said, there will be the time that you might need to go do something and your daycare is closed, maybe it's a weekend. Have another family friend. Whether an older person or a younger person raising children around your age or a middle-aged person that has older children. But we also be careful, you know, in the environment you're taking your children into. Just make sure it's a safe place that you're taking them into. So networking with others is very, very important. Raising children in diaspora, you need your village. You have to find your village. If you're a person of faith and you go to a church, find people within the church. Find people within your community that speak your language. Even people at work. You know, sometimes you make friends from work. I remember when we first moved to our house where we still live right now, the neighbor across the street also happened to be a registered nurse. And then she happens to know some of the African people that I knew. She's Caucasian. So we got talking. You know, we talk, we talk on nursing. Uh, my children can go over there. We call our grandma, you know, and all that. She had cats, grandma with the cats. You know, I didn't like cats, but I needed help. So my kids could go over there for anything. I need to go grocery shopping and I don't want to take them with me. I can quickly shop them over there for a couple of hours and do that. So networking is very, very important. It saves you a lot of headache. Catch them young. Catch them young. We really, really have to catch them young. Um, on this page right now, this is my daycare. This is one of the rooms at my daycare. And um, sometimes when I'm, you know, we're doing cleaning up after in the afternoon or something spills or anything, I get them involved in it. So this girl right here is five years old. Uh, she was just standing in the hallway that day, just looking around. And I'm like, oh, would you like to mop the room with me? Okay, I will sweep and you do the mopping. So it wasn't a command. It was a suggestion. Would you like to mop the floors with me? And she said, yes, she would like to try it. And you know, one thing with children at this age is things look interesting to them. So the fact that this mop had a lever where her hand is that she has to press, for the water to spray on the floor, that was enough attraction for her. So she was more than happy to mop the floor. Now, did she mop it 100% right? No. But at this stage, she feels important. She feels she's doing something. She's taking part, uh, taking some of the work I'm supposed to do. I know she's a daycare child. I know her parents are paying me for her to be there. But the fact also remains that the way the education system is made for this age here, uh, it encourages autonomy, it encourages skill building, it, it encourages, 
you getting them involved in what you're doing. So before COVID, we were really, really encouraged that when we're serving food for them, let someone put out the plate, put the food in the middle of the table for the preschoolers and let them serve themselves. But when COVID came, we stopped that. Just so people are not touching too many things. And we, I just haven't restarted that at my daycare. So back then, we will have milk in a small side jug and somebody will pour milk for the other. Somebody will put the cups out. So when your child at home pretends like they can't do anything, they're pretending. If they are in daycare, they can do certain things. Because in the daycare setting, a licensed daycare setting, we are expected to encourage them to do stuff like this. So if we're going outside to play uh, in snow time, we're supposed to just tell them it's time to dress up. I have a picture on the wall. What is the first thing to do? The first thing to do is put your snow pants on. The next thing to do is put your jacket on. The next thing to do is your boots. The next thing is your meetings and your toque and stuff like that. And most of the time they do it themselves. And this is where community helps them. Some of them come, they can't do anything. They just sit there looking at everybody else. They sit there looking at you, expecting you to do it for them. Because at home, parents, we've done everything for them. But after a week, two weeks, three weeks, and they see everyone else is dressed and ready to go, and we're waiting for them, they start learning to do things by themselves. And before you know it, within a month, even for some of them, they can dress themselves up. So check that at home. How much stuff can my child do on their own? Once you know they can do it, back off. That reduces your work. Let them do it. When a child makes a mess, they pour water on the table or spill water on the floor. Don't be so quick to grab the towel and mop it for them. Hand them the towel and say, clean up your mess. That's one of the words at daycare. Clean up. If you make a mess, you clean it up. And they are happy to do it at daycare. So why shouldn't they do it at home? Get them involved, you know, in day-to-day -day activities. Make it fun for them. I'll see if this one will play. It's going to be a little bit noisy. It's at daycare one of the days. Uh, we were done eating. And there's the little girl in the, you know, in the high chair and this boy was just playing around. I'm like, oh, would you like to clean our table for me? And I gave her wipes. And that's another thing that you need to have in your home if you're raising little children. It's, okay. Yeah, it works. You can see how happy he was, how he was looking so serious. Like to, to him, he's doing serious work right there cleaning the table for the little girl. And to, and for me, for this boy, is the fact that he just got a baby sister also. So I've just been talking to him, you know, casually about, oh, are you helping mommy at home? You know, are you helping daddy? Are you bringing diaper for mommy when she needs to change baby's diaper and throw it in the garbage and all that? And the day I actually visited him at home and had to change the diaper, I handed it over to him and I said, go throw it in the garbage. So that's how we keep them engaged in doing stuff at home and it becomes a fun thing for them because when they become um, uh, teenagers and you have to chase them to clean their room and stuff like that, if they've started it early, sometimes for most of them, because teenagers, they are not on another level. You know, we had a session for teenagers yesterday. If you have them, you know it's another level of grace to raise teenagers and young adults. But do it so that at least it's in inside of them already. They know that this is something I am supposed to do. So, um, I'm just going to show us um, what, some of the things that I always encourage people that have younger children to have at home is wipes. So that boy was cleaning the table with wipes. But sometimes I will do face cloth. Like this face cloth, it's a pack of four. It's from Dollarama, I believe. It's just uh, $4. This one is $4 in different colors. Uh, when I was talking about, um, they don't necessarily have to shower in the mornings. Uh, if they shower the night before in the mornings, these are the things you might have around. You know, just put it under warm water, wash their face, wash their armpits, you know, wash in between their legs, and they can dress up for the next day. Now, I'm going to take a little more time on screen time because I know we struggle with that. Even as someone that runs daycare, Mondays are always hard because kids come back to daycare on Monday and it's like everything has been let loose over the weekend, which even in my own house, they don't watch TV during the week. And I'm saying day, it's only one person now. The other two are adults, they have their own phones, but the little one, she doesn't watch TV during the week. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's like they want to watch TV 24-7. So when these kids come back to daycare on Monday, you can see that, yes, you've had overload of screen time over the weekend. And I mean, we're busy. Sometimes that have to happen. But it's interesting to note that um, this uh, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in 2022 states that children between uh, 0 to 18 months are not supposed to even have screen time at all. 
He said, none except video chat with an adult. And I was surprised when I saw it. Not that I didn't know about it. Not that I didn't know, you know, the effect and all that. But I said, okay, so when kids are below the age of 18 months, that's when they need one-on-one -on -one attention a lot more. And parents, sometimes you're preparing for professional exam. You have, you know, work stuff to do. Uh, busy in ministry, busy at school. Things are going on in our lives. So what are we supposed to do with these children if they can't watch screen? If they can't have screen time? You know, so I'll get to that later. And this screen breaks it down. This PowerPoint breaks it down. You know, as our children, how many hours they're supposed to have. I know sometimes we have no choice but to let them watch Coco Melon, which seems to be the nemesis right now. Everybody is on Coco Melon. But I always think through the fact that when I first moved here, Treehouse was the main thing that every child watched. Uh, and Treehouse had its own channel. But most of the shows on Treehouse back then, there were lots of educative, you know, shows on there. Do I know now Tukoko Melon has all those nursery rhymes and stuff like that? So it goes back to us as parents deciding, okay, if I have no other alternative and my child must do screen time, what kind of screen time are they doing? How long are they doing the screen time for? Who is monitoring the screen time? Are they just there doing it? I have no control over it and they're just in front of it. And before I remember, you know, three hours they've been watching screen time. So I use myself as an example. When COVID hit and lots of meetings moved to virtual and stuff like that, when I have a virtual meeting, I'll say like, okay, sweetheart, take the iPad, you know, do something on it. But at this stage, I had to say, okay, I'm going to be in my meeting for two hours. So watch one episode on Superbook. Uh, we'll pick one, maybe it's Joseph or something, Daniel, whatever. Watch one episode of Superbook. There's IXL maths, you know, practice maths for this number of minutes. And there's timer on the iPad. So we'll put timer to see until the timer rings. You can't change what you're watching. Uh, do this on this, do this on this. Then you can play a game for 10 minutes, for 15 minutes, for 20 minutes. Now, do they always stay within the time? Not always. But at least you're putting some checks into what they're watching on the screen time. Now, the other part of us reducing the screen time. So if you follow me on Instagram, I posted my godson on there yesterday. I forgot to add it to this video. On there yesterday that uh, the mother sent me that video to see you told us not to give them screen time see how your son is destroying my kitchen so that's some one of the other things we have to find alternatives and that's why where i think we struggle as parents sometimes because the alternative sometimes will include that you spend time sitting there with them there are ways around it that you're there with them and you might still be able to be doing something else while you're there so for example you're cooking in the kitchen have them in the kitchen with you. If you have a gate to section of the kitchen so they can't crawl off for those that are still crawling, just make sure your child house is safe. Make sure your plugins are plugged, that they can't put anything inside it. Make sure it's a safe environment for them. And let them just play around you. Now, what are they playing with? Uh, you probably have seen all these videos about, you know, giving children two things and pitch, looking to see which one will they grab. So you give them uh, real keys and toy keys, they always go for the real keys. You give them the toy phone and a real phone, they always go for the real phone. You give them sippy cup and a can of Coke, they go for the Coke. So that means our everyday things around us at home are more attractive to them than the expensive toys that we're spending money on. Definitely there are some toys that help them to develop, you know, fine motor skill, gross motor skills, uh, educational material, you know, all those toys that have, you know, A, B, C, D, one, two, three, and stuff like that. They're very good. Our kids need them. But we also have to look around our home. So in the world of early childhood education, there's something called loose parts, loose parts. And I'm going to show you something. So I have a bucket here with me. But because I'm using my laptop, I don't have anybody to help me to be moving camera around. I'm, I'm looking forward to the time that I'll be able to do class sessions and I'll have someone moving camera around for me. So we have something called loose parts. So if you want to take a screenshot of this page, uh, of this screen, please do so because I'm going to move it right away. So, so I'm just bringing stuff out of my loose parts container and then we're going to talk about that. So if anybody needs that page later, I can bring it back up. Let's let's move on. Okay, so for preschoolers, let's start with preschoolers, which even the loose parts I'm going to show you applies to both preschoolers and infants. So what are the things you can make available at home? If you moved from Nigeria, I'll use Nigeria for an example, and your child is probably four or five, 
They probably know a lot of things already that in the daycare system here, it's not part of the curriculum. The, play, the daycare system here operates on a play and learn system. So we don't necessarily sit your child down and ask them to count from one to 100. We don't necessarily sit your child down and have paper and pencil for them to trace A, B, C, write number one to 20 and stuff like that every time. I do it off and on. But in the process of play, they learn all of those things anyway. So that's the way the system works here. So if you have children from Africa that you brought in here that already know the, most of those things, then go to stores like, you know, Dollar Store, Dollarama, and find all those kindergarten or preschool books and, you know, pencil, markers and everything and have them work on it. And I allow it at my daycare. Some kids bring theirs to daycare. For all my preschoolers and kindergartners, I have those books for them. And they sit down to do work on it. So board puzzles, uh, if they're going to do screen time, monitor what the screen time is about. So at my daycare, we do screen time in the morning when we do our devotion. So if we do a Bible story, we'll find your corresponding video for it. We'll watch it together. We'll talk about it before we pray and, you know, we start the day and stuff like that. There are exercise videos on, on YouTube. There are kids exercise videos. Familiarize yourself with those ones. Do it together with them. See, in doing it together with them, you're passing across the message that exercise is good. You're getting your exercise. You're getting them occupied for a little while. You still screen time, but the screen time is also teaching you something else. There are educational videos. During COVID, we got interested in watching videos of interesting places in the world, you know, under the sea, you know, mountains and things like that. And those are interesting things that even me, myself, some of those places I didn't know. There was one we watched about the, uh, oh, I said boundaries. What is it called? The borders, international borders. So there's this one, I think it's Zambia and Zimbabwe, that their border is a waterfall and it's so beautiful. That is something I just learned during COVID by watching those videos with my daughter. Baking shoes, five minutes craft shoes. If you've watched those kids baking shoes before, you see children as young as seven, eight, nine competing. And some of them win and they say, I've been baking since I was five. They learned it from somewhere. So those are skills that our children can gain from screen time if we absolutely have no other option but to make sure, you know, but to let them have screen time. And if you're also doing YouTube, make sure you have a YouTube account. Set your filters so it's avoiding pop-ups on your screen that are not appropriate for children to work. So let's go back to the infant alternate for screen time for infant. So I said I have a box, have a container, buy something. This is mine. But this is just for what we're doing today. The one at daycare is really big than this. Have a container and find random things. So some of the things I have in this, this is an old remote. We don't even know what it belongs to anymore. Children love remotes. This is a real remote. You take the batteries out for safety, throw it in there. This is the sunglasses that my little one doesn't want to use. Put it in there. Measuring cup, uh, shower curtain hook, random, random, random things. Lead, container, your, this is from jam that has finished since forever. There are some, you know, sensory toys in there that are real uh, play stuff. This is an example of a puzzle box. Just find random things to put in there. So those things keep them engaged for a little while in a safe manner. And you can be busy doing whatever else you need to do. An activity that we do, you know, there are lots of activities. But this one I'm going to just, uh, oh, everyone has been here. Okay. Just, let's just pretend. Okay. So this is a regular thing in your kitchen. So while you're in the kitchen cooking, your child is with you there. Give them this. This is pipe cleaner. You find it in any store that sell crafts, craft supplies anywhere. This is what the bag looks like from Dollar Store Dollarama. So what I'm showing you this is this is fine motor skills. So this tiny hose in this coriander, we call it sieve also. Just give them this and they can put it through it. And you see the joy on their face that they were able to put it through it. And you can have them put it through it. The older one, they can put it and interlock it and keep doing it until they have so many colors in there. So activities like that are some of the diversion that we need to create for our children. So I don't throw things out anymore since I started running the kit. Because everything that you think is junk that you want to throw out, trust me, put it in that container with your loose part. We call it loose part. And you see your children have fun for hours. They will even build a tower out of random things. Like here, this is even a glasses case that I'm not using anymore. It's part of loose parts. They will play with it. Random, random things and they will be happy. Another thing they can do 
going back to chores is uh, this is magic eraser so occasionally you look at the walls of your house they need to be clean give everybody a magic eraser get it wet and it over you to join them this is your spot of the wall this is my side of the wall and clean it at daycare i have two kids that don't like napping so when they don't nap in the afternoon and they say we're bored we've read all the books there's nothing else to do this and that i'm like okay let's clean the walls so we get, grab our magic eraser and, we, and they love cleaning the walls because they can see that this wall was dirty before. Now, all of a sudden, my side looks cleaner than your side. So it's encouraging to them. They keep working at it. So this portion here, I will be talking about teaching our children about safety. There are videos online you can watch. There's a video link that I put here, but I'm not going to bother to play it. I can send them. I, I, if you're on my parenting page, on Instagram, you have this video already. I know I sent it out immediately that day. So teach your children about safety. You know, don't run in the parking lot. Uh, don't put pencil or anything into the plug-in in the wall. Don't talk to strangers. Don't open the front door when somebody knocks without me there saying open the door. You know, things like that. We need to educate our children about it. And safe touch is very, very important. And that's why I like this video, because at the end of, the day, of this video, it talks about good touch and bad touch. And there's so many books online. I'm still looking for a PDF version of um, Don't Touch My Body or something like that for boys and girls. When I find it, I'll send it out. But there is this book, and this was a little touchy for me when I brought it up this morning because the author is, is late, uh, Pastor Nomthi Udukoya. So she did this book, No, Don't Touch Me There. And it's a very good book. It's available on Amazon. You can buy the Kindle version, download it, and read. And by the time your child is getting, you know, five, in fact, I'll say four, five, six, you know, educate them, watch shows like this together about, you know what, nobody should touch you here, nobody should touch you there. Those are only the parts that, you know, when I'm bathing you, I'm allowed to touch it. If anybody touches you there and say, this is our little secret, don't tell anybody else, that is your you know, that is your way of knowing that that person has no good intentions for you. And feel free to come tell mommy or daddy about what that person did to you. So we need to be very, very wise. You know, we're living in a world right now that certain things that we didn't know about when we were younger are beginning to happen and we can't afford to turn a blind eye to it. So we have to educate our children earlier. Sex education is starting in school earlier. They're going into real details with them. There are books in the school libraries that children in grade four can borrow and it's good there was one that goes real into detail about touching each other's penis and vagina and how their body felt good about it and this book was for grade four students so we need to be very very proactive when it comes to teaching our children stuff like that now i will say here if anybody has any question please be dropping it in the chat box now uh, i'm almost done with the powerpoint and then i will take questions at at the end and then we can call it a day. So some of the activities like I was talking about, I know, I sincerely know that when you're in a hurry and you have a few time to do stuff, you don't want anybody helping you that will make extra mess. But if we don't let them help us and make that extra mess, they will not learn. And you have to keep the end goal in mind. You're, you're trying to raise children that later will be able to stand and do stuff by themselves. So they need to start practicing as early as that daycare age. So squeezing and peeling oranges. The small tangerine oranges before COVID, we used to give it to the kids at daycare and they found it interesting that they wow. open it themselves. So that's part of the thing. Instead of opening it for them every time, let them try it. Playing with blocks, brushing their hair, brushing their teeth, zippers on, the, on their uh, jacket, pouring. See, pouring water in a cup, drinking from a cup, kid safe scissors. So at daycare, another activity we do is uh, the flyers that get delivered in your mailbox. I keep them. And there are days that we practice how to use the scissors. And we when we first started practicing, I sent a message to the parents that keep your scissors out of the way at home. We've started practicing using scissors here because I know the next thing that will happen is the children will go home and start cutting everything cutting table cover, cutting window blind, cutting their bed sheets, you know, stuff like that. So I have to warn the parents about that. But your child needs to learn how to use the scissors. And then we educate them on don't cut anything until your parents are away and gives you permission to cut it. So those are some of the activities. You can take a screenshot that your children need to start doing now. It will make your life easier. It will help them to learn things and they feel happy. When they are able to do some of these things for themselves. Okay, let's find who that is. 
Okay, I can't find the person that's talking. If you know yourself, okay, I find you and I've muted you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, oh yeah, that there, there's a video, so I'm going to have us watch this. So let, let's watch this first. Right? Yeah, it's coming. It's just the music got off. Baby, yeah, 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 Okay, so this little one here, the video came on as a picture. What she was actually doing is um, taking dishes out of the out of the dishwasher. So initially, she was taking just the spoons and the forks and all that. And at this stage, she actually carried real plates, like adult-sized plates, out of the dishwasher. And I think if I remember correctly, she carried one in each hand. And I know we'll be like, oh my God, if she drops it, she will break the plates. But it shows that she's been doing it for a little while. As small as she is, she can lift those real plates out and hand them over to her parents to put away. And if you listen very well when the one that was making formula for the baby, the other sister in the car seat beside her was involved in the process. And the mom said, I didn't even ask her to do it. So she took initiative. She had seen the mother do it before, or maybe she had done it at home before. Baby is crying. Maybe the parents is driving. She went into action without being asked. And that's what happens when we give our children that um, independence in court to try certain things that we might feel they are not able to do. Children actually learn really fast. So my encouragement to us today as parents, you know, first-time parents and toddler parents and preschoolers is uh, study your child, okay? Every child's capability and capacity is different. But if you provide the environment for them to learn and grow in the little they know, guess what? They learn and they do more. When you do chores, like the first one that they were putting clothes in the dryer, to that baby, it's like fun, you know? Like we're doing it together, or I'm here, and they want to be around you, right? So they're with you. You're folding clothes, they're folding clothes, you're putting things away, you're doing it together, you're doing dishes, they're rinsing it. Get them involved in every activity that you're doing. And that way they can build up into, you know, responsible, you know, elementary age children, preteens, teenagers, youth, adults, and all that. Whatever we're looking for in the future, the journey starts today. Immediately you give birth to that child, the journey starts. When the baby is still small, back to first-time parents, uh, if they want to be held to go to bed, to go to sleep, that's fine. There's a school of thought that says, oh, if you hold them too much, then they'll have uh, separation anxiety, then they'll be too attached. There's the school of thought that says, it's okay, leave them in their crib, they will be fine. You know, if they cry a little while before they fall to sleep, that's fine. Uh, play white noise, play this, play that. Find what will work for you. 
okay because all of these things are theory to a large extent until you are in it wearing the shoe and you're doing it like if you have a baby that's a light sleeper and all of you in your house are loud talking people and you make noise all the time that means you have to figure out how to not make that much noise gradually until your child gets used to being able to sleep through the noise so it's a it's a process of you know um, evaluating what you're doing daily to see is it working is it not working what can we change what can we add on and for those that are not first time parents now you have another child early no no, no <laughs> not early so maybe your two kids maybe they're one year apart the older one would definitely be jealous because all of a sudden the the center of attraction has shifted to someone else please get them involved in taking care of that baby uh, languages like don't touch my baby Oh, I'm busy right now. I don't have time for you. You have to limit that. It's not your baby now. It's our baby. So, oh, like that video where that girl was making food. Oh, she's making food for her baby sister or brother. Oh, would you like to carry your baby brother? Oh, can you throw the diaper out for your baby brother? Oh, can you bring me this for your baby brother? Let them have ownership. That reduces the jealousy. That reduces the competition to a great extent. So that's my encouragement to us. I didn't plan for this to take forever. I was hoping you would have questions, but it looks like um, I haven't seen any question in the chat. So I'm going to throw it open now. If you have any question, let's take that really quick. And uh, for those of you that do not know, so that means probably you're watching any of my events for the first time. I have two books. I have one on parenting and it's available on Amazon or you could buy it through my website. So I have a website where I post uh, blogs. Uh, you can send me questions on there. If you have a group of friends and you would like, you know, a session on whatever topic about parenting, you can notify me on there to book that also. If you, social media, Instagram and Facebook, uh, you can find me there with uh, parenting with CIMT. I also have a community, WhatsApp community. So the WhatsApp community operates in a way that you are on there. No one else knows who is on there. But when I send messages out, it goes to each person individually. And if you have any question, you can send it to me directly. And I announce any program that I have through that website also. So, um, okay, how can we manage uh, uh, toddler tantrums? I will be surprised if nobody asks this question. So, okay, so tantrums happens to be the way of communication for toddlers because, let me stop sharing. Okay. So toddler happen to be the way that uh, toddler uh, tantrums happen to be the way they communicate. Toddlers don't have language. Okay, so all the language they know from being a baby is to cry when they need something, uh, to grunt, to stomp, to show us you know body language, sign language, and all that. So now they're toddlers. They have a few words, but they don't have all the words. So right now you're telling them we're going grocery shopping, and they're in a store and they can see all these shiny, beautiful things. They can see all these food items. It's enticing to the eyes. They want it, but you're saying no. And they know that you love them, so they don't understand why you're saying no. So because they want that thing and you're saying no and they don't understand it, they will react in a way that turns out to be a tantrum. How to deal with tantrum actually is the first time that it happens. How you deal with it the first time will help you gradually as the child learns what not to do. So the first time it happens, Calm voice, talk about it. Sweetheart, we can't have chocolate at this store shopping time. Maybe another time when we come back, I can get you chocolate. But for today, it's not on the list, so we are not getting chocolate. Or whatever it is you've told them about that item before you left home. So there's also the portion of preparing them before you leave home. But if we're talking, people be look, between the age of 18 months and 30 months, they don't understand what you're saying. They're watching your body language. They're watching your facial expression. So when you're explaining stuff like that to them, you have to make sure you're not smiling when what you're trying to tell them is a serious matter. Make sure your face looks serious. Make sure you have a calm language, a calm tone of voice and say, sweetheart, we're going to the mall or we're going to the store. There are lots of people in the store. It's not nice for one person to be screaming and making noise and making everyone else comfortable. And when we're out there, if you ask me for something, even if you ask nicely, and I don't think you need that thing. I am going to say no. And I need you to accept the no without making a sin. So when we go there, you say, remember we talked about it. 
I had said no, and it's staying as a no. So maybe when we get back home, we can talk about it again. And then next time we'll come to the store, we can do it. Now, there will be those ones that you can do everything that the book says to do. And they will still do a tantrum. When it becomes embarrassing, sometimes your only solution is pick up your child and leave the store. And I say this knowing that you really don't have time. You booked that one hour to do shopping. And now this child is cutting through your one hour. But sometimes that might be the best response for them to get the message. There was this video of this uh, man that the girl did a tantrum in the store. So he took her outside, sat her in front of, on, on top of the car, who sat there with him. And he was actually recording and say, well, you're crying. Uh, I'm recording you. Can you see yourself? Now we came here to shop and you decided to throw a tantrum. So we're now going to sit here. So that means we're not buying anything. And we're just going to sit here until you're ready to, you know, stop crying. Then we can go back in the store. And if you don't stop crying, then we're going back home. So there are different approaches to it. Last approach that I tried, that I had to try with my kids at a stage was, okay, I'm going grocery shopping. You want to go with me. But the last time we went, you did not behave well. You were making noise because of something I did not get. So this time you're not going with me. But you can only do that if you have a network, if you have a community, if you have a support system that you can say you're staying with auntie while I go grocery shopping. So to toddlers, preschoolers, at a certain stage, they learn better by experience than from lectures. So you have to try different approach and you also have to study your child. What moves them? See, there are some children that the best language they understand is, I told you not to do something and you decided to disobey me and you do it. So this is the TV remote. I'm going to keep it and there will be no TV for one day. And they get the message for life. But some people, you can take away all the privileges and whatever, and they will still push your buttons and push your stuff. And this is where we need patience and grace as parents. And we need prayer also to say, God, reveal to me this child. How, what is the best approach to handle this child? And your children will always be different. So what worked for my first one is not working with the last one right now. So mm -hmm. that, that, that's my answer to that tantrum issue. You have to play around till you find the right language that your child will understand. So thank you for that question, Sister uh, Sumbo. Any other question from anyone else? Any other questions? No question? Okay, so if there are no other questions, I think we're, we're done for today then. Because I've looked at my notes and I think we've talked about everything on the PowerPoint. And um, yeah. So if you have any question you think of later, you can message me. If you have my phone number, go ahead and message me. If you don't, you can email me, info at olawumiyutuga.com. And I'll take the, and I'll answer the question over there. So thank you so much for joining. Pass the message on, help another parent. We are in this community together. We can't afford to not help one another. Uh, God will help us. We'll raise our children well. They will turn out well. Uh, we'll be proud of them. God will be proud of them. And we rebuke the end of the devourer over our families. Uh, no evil will befall any one of you in the name of Jesus. So God bless you. Thank you so much. I will stop the recording now in case somebody wanted to talk and recording they don't want stopped. it recorded. I'll stop the recording. Uh, I'll still be here for five minutes if anyone wanted to talk without it being recorded. Otherwise, then we're done. So uh, follow me on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, buy my books if you don't have it already. I really, really appreciate that. And uh, spread the news to other, your other friends too. Yeah, God bless you. So I'll let you know when my next class will be. Uh, it will be for another age group. And then there's one coming up on parenting in diaspora. So that one will be for everybody. So you get to know about it if you follow me on any of my platform or you're a member of Jesus House. I'll let you know when parenting in diaspora session will be. And for those that might have teenagers, um, I had a session with uh, Dr. Mobala Jeffries yesterday. It's on YouTube. 
parenting uh, pertinent questions that we need to be able to answer our teenagers. So you can look that up on Thy Precious Jewels YouTube channel. You'll find the, uh, the poster with my picture and Dr. Mobilade. So you can share that with people in your life that have teenagers. So God bless you all. Have a fantastic weekend. Thanks for spending your one hour with me.